Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields, and uh, I'm all ready to go here. So let's get her started. Uh, on the program today, we have Fred Rouse and uh, Tyler Kuski and Zachary Moore. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Glad to have you here. Uh, starting out, uh, we want to start talking a little bit about one of the uh, big moves that happened in the elections this year, which was the legalization of recreational pot in a whole bunch of, I think every place there was an election except for perhaps one or two states. Uh, but most importantly, California, the what, seventh largest economy in the world, uh, recreational pot is now legal. You know something about the uh, process both before and after. Uh, tell us a little bit, what are the, the primary ramifications of the, the passage of Prop 64? Well, uh, marijuana prior to the passage of Prop 64 was uh, permitted for medical purposes. Um, after Proposition 64, it now can be possessed, uh, cultivated, and transported for recreational purposes. Um, that's a big uh, change from the way the criminal law treated recreational use of marijuana. Uh, before, the criminal law would treat it as a misdemeanor or a felony. Uh, especially a felony if you were selling or transporting a uh, certain amount. Uh, now uh, these criminal sanctions are now misdemeanors um, if you are possessing for sales or if you're cultivating beyond your limits or if you're uh, transporting more than you're supposed to. So for individuals, they can now freely across the state um, possess up to an ounce of marijuana. Um, they can transport up to an ounce in their, their vehicle. Um, they can grow six plants in their home. Um, the issue with that that could, that could be there is that the landlords and could prevent you from growing inside your place as part of your lease. So that's something you have to watch out for. But generally speaking, you're going to be able to possess uh, and transport and to a certain extent grow uh, marijuana with six plants and have an ounce. The six plants is per uh, building, though, right, or per household, not per, per person? Uh, per household, yes. Um, under the medical marijuana law that was passed uh, <coughs> last year that Jerry Brown si uh, signed, uh, you're allowed to have five patients in your home, and you can grow for five patients uh, worth of marijuana inside uh, your house under that law. How many, so, how many plants under that? Under that, uh, the, you're, it's, le it's less about plants, it's about medical needs. So you're allowed yeah. to grow for your medical need. Um, the limit on spacing, I believe, is 100 square feet. Um, and so there's still, under the law, uh, more, I guess, protection for medical marijuana. You're going to be able to do more with marijuana, whether it be growing it um, or possessing it uh, under the medical regime still. Okay, and this is all in, uh, went into effect as of uh, the, the day after the election? Yes, the passage of the proposition. Okay, but sale, uh, retail sale, commercial production, all of that has yet to be uh, uh, put under a regulatory scheme so that it can be legal, is that correct? That's true. Um, the regulatory scheme is going to be developed over the next year, and in 2018, the, uh, supposedly the state and local jurisdictions, local counties, are going to be issuing uh, licenses. And so in order to cultivate uh, you know, ma mass quantities, uh, in order to engage in retail sales, um, you're going to need a, a license. And you're going to need a license both from the state and from the local government. Is the local government license, is that mandatory or is that up to the county? Uh, they could say, we don't care, you could just do whatever you want if, if they wanted to? Uh, you would need the the state. You is need gonna, the state license. It, I understand. The state is going to require to get their license. You have some sort of county permission. Oh, okay. So the state is going to require a county regulatory scheme. Right. They're going to say you're going to need the the county's permission before you come and apply with us at the state. Don't talk to us until you talk to the county. Is that the that yes? It? And many counties now are are working on uh, their their regulatory schemes. I know in El Dorado County, I'm I'm part of the Libertarian Party of El Dorado County. Uh, they're holding or they were holding. Uh, meetings at the board with the board of supervisors to sort of develop these regulations um, in Sacramento County there's actually a, a city council meeting uh, next week where the uh, guidelines for getting a permit from uh, Sacramento County will be uh, debated and possibly adopted um, so I encourage anybody who's interested in this issue to make yourself known at the Sacramento County uh, City Council next week uh, you can go to their website and you can see the proposal, uh, the ordinance online, and you can kind of get ready for it. And it's important for people, uh, especially the smaller growers out there, to really uh, try to influence the process because with any sort of regulatory scheme, uh, a government scheme, 
there's going to be special interests that are going to be able to creep in there, lobbyists and, and the connected people to the government. And so if you're a local grower, grower a small time grower, and this is an entrepreneurial small business opportunity for you, you need to get out there and protect yourself uh, from the lobbyists that are going to control this regulatory scheme. I would like to chip in, first of all, let's rename it. I'm not a big propaganda guy, but the terms are important. I would say let's rename marijuana cannabis. Cannabis is a medical um, herb that's been used for centuries, um, millennia, in India, Asia, Chinese medicine, Indian medicine, herbal medicine, it's anti-inflammatory, it's anti-pain. Um, so most of the regulation that's being foisted upon us through the passage of Prop 64 is, um, is going to allow for large cultivation by moneyed interests. It's going to create a le levels of regulation at the city, county, and state levels, which will prevent people from growing their own medical cannabis, which is highly beneficial to people that have uh, okay, Alzheimer's patients, autistic patients, there's all kinds, epilepsy patients, people that are going through chemotherapy. There's documented evidence that cannabinoids are anti-cancer in high doses um, that may cause psychoactive effects. But these, the, the benefits of the, the cannabinoids, THC, CBD, cannabidiol, are documented and undeniable. And what we have now is the pharmaceutical industry seeing um, a threat to their, to their business model, and they want to control it. Um, so we, as freedom-loving individuals, need to protect the right of individuals to grow an herb. And the Prop 64 allows the you know, local regulation, they're forcing growing indoors. Do you want to have fans and lights and energy consumption to grow a plant that you can easily grow in your backyard? Well, you know, right now, this law says you can't grow this herb in your backyard. You have to grow it indoors. How, what sense is, what? I don't get that at all. Under the, under the new law, you are correct, the counties are going to be able to prohibit outdoor growing without uh, much um, pushback from the state. So that is a concern and, I, and, you know, like the energy production is, is a concern. And I agree with you with the, the medical aspect. Um, you know, I think everybody watching and all of us know somebody that's benefited from medical cannabis uh, or, you know, but the, the problem is, is the federal government's war on cannabis, misguided war for these many decades has created a situation where they schedule it a schedule one drug like it's heroin or cocaine and that has prevented research and scientists from being able to look at the uh, the can the cannabis plant to find its medicinal purposes and so if it weren't for that misguided war uh, on cannabis by the federal government we would know a lot more now about uh, the medical benefits of cannabis and I think after this um, and this the way this movement is going we're gonna learn a lot more I think very soon I'd like to, right. like to welcome Sam Warnkin to the show. He uh, is a victim of infrastructure neglect in California, the uh, <laughs> traffic jam on Highway uh, 80 coming in from what, Dixon? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the federal and state, uh, well, two different ways of looking at marijuana. Under, under uh, the Controlled Substances Act, Mar marijuana is still cannabis, uh, however Thank you want you. to frame it, is still uh, a prohibited uh, class one narcotic, can't be. Uh, no medical purpose, et cetera, yeah, yada, yada, yada. How will the, uh, the feds react under a Trump administration? So how, how will the feds react to all of this legalization going on here in California and elsewhere? It's tough to say. I mean, I think it would depend on who they choose for attorney general. I remember during the Republican primary, uh, a, an exchange between Ram Paul and Chris Christie. And Chris Christie indicated that he would be uh, willing to prosecute uh, people in Colorado for using legal recreational marijuana. 
Um, so somebody like a Chris Christie, I think, should be uh, disqualified from being an attorney general. Well, I think he's in, in running now for the uh, the uh, 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 Supreme Food Court, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Possibly the FDA. <laughs> um, well, yeah, you know, somebody with that attitude, though, is, is somebody you don't want because the, the approach now from the, um, the federal government is sort of a more hands-off approach. I mm -hmm. mean, they have done some raids here and there, but they take a more hands-off approach to places that the states that have legalized it. Um, if Chris Christie wants to fulfill that campaign promise and is put as attorney general, that could be troublesome for those who believe in the right, the freedom, and the liberty to enjoy cannabis, both recreationally and for medical purposes. Do you anticipate that the Trump attorney general will be somebody like Chris Christie? I don't think it's going to be Chris Christie with all of his Bridgegate uh, scandals. Uh, he's kind of fallen out of favor, but it's somebody like him. Uh, do you anticipate somebody like that or somebody more like Rand Paul? I wouldn't be Rand Paul, but somebody, somebody with more of a laissez-faire attitude. You know, I have to admit that it's tough to predict. Trump is a very difficult person <laughs> to predict, and I, I think we've all learned that. Um, but, you know, he, it, should be, it should be noted that that choice for attorney general will have a direct effect on, on the cannabis uh, situation here in California. But more importantly, who you elect as your local district attorney, um, local law enforcement will have much more effect on the availability of medical cannabis in the next 10 years than the federal government will. I would, I would disagree with that slightly. I think okay. your board of supervisors at your county level is going to have a bigger effect because they're yeah. the ones who are going to be writing these regulations and passing the ordinances. Um, that's true of city councils as well. And so that's the place where you want to have your direct effect is to, to go to these meetings. And, you know, the government's interesting, though. They will uh, post, hey, you know, we're having this meeting on their website. You know, they don't do a lot of work to publicize it so that people will actually show up. And then they can come back and say, well, we wrote these regulations with uh, public input, you know, and, and maybe three people showed up to the meeting. Yeah. So that's something to be looking out for. And I, I encourage anybody interested in this issue in their locality across the state here in Sacramento County to to go to your city council or your board of supervisor meetings. Yeah, I live in, in Yolo County and uh, already uh, people are are. Uh, uh, making their their voices heard at the city council and at the county board of supervisors as to what the what direction uh, uh, county or local regulation should should take. Uh, any word yet on which counties are uh, trying to do the right thing? I mean, is is Humboldt County, for instance, stepping out and trying to uh, to do things uh, properly, or uh, are there any counties that are saying uh, no, not in our backyard? I think the jury's still out. We're going to learn a lot this year. Um, you know, Calaveras County has, I know that they are denying and, and issuing permits. And it's actually interesting that uh, I went to a, a meeting of the state regulators uh, where they were making a presentation. And they uh, said these counties are getting ahead of us um, in developing their uh, regulations and their ordinances. And we'd like to see them slow down and let us catch up and let them kind of model what they're doing off our regulations. So you already see this sort of tension there between the state and the local governments. And, and you have to remember, I mean, you have to get a license from the county and from the state. And so that's, you know, that's two ways that the government can, can stop you from uh, pursuing your economic freedom. Well, this is interesting to me because I uh, do a lot of watch of regulatory capture by industry. Uh, and regulatory capture by industry, I mean that, for instance, the trucking industry, the moving van companies, the big ones, they, they control the, the state licensing board uh, to the extent that they, in many cases, will deny entry to uh, a new competitor for no good reason. When this, you know, who, who are these regulators? Who are these people that are, and how are they selected? How are the people who are going to be making the rules at both the state level and at the county level, how are they being selected and who are they? Do we know yet? We do. Uh, there has been a head appointed for the Bureau of uh, Cannabis Control, I believe is the new name now. Okay. It, was, uh, it was called something Not else. marijuana, thank Not you. Mar yeah, it, yes, they do <laughs> use the, the cannabis uh, term, which is, I think, more accurate. Um, and so these people are going to be hired uh, you know, by the state. Uh, it's going to be hard to figure out who they are. Um, the, the best place is, is your board of supervisors at the local level. They're the, they're the local stakeholders. They're the ones who are going to be, um, you know, controlling what these local ordinances are. Well, let me like. ask the question a different way. Who's doing the appointing and who's doing the hiring? Well, I, um, I understand Governor Brown appointed the head of the, the Bureau of Medical or of, of Cannabis Control. Get okay. these uh, government agencies all mixed up. 
Uh, there's too many of them. Does that require uh, <laughs> legislative uh, approval in any way, or is it just a, governor, a governor's appointment? Uh, I believe it's just a governor's appointment, and, okay. he, and he, he made that appointment. Um, and then I believe they're just going to hire, you know, it was interesting at the meeting I went to, they were asking for people to apply. So really? I guess they're they're hard up for people. Were they, to, were they getting uh, volunteers? Uh, I, I don't think at this meeting they were getting volunteers. Um, there, were, there were some hungry big government types there, hungry to regulate, so maybe those are the ones who will apply. But, you know, I, I uh, encourage all the libertarians out there to apply and, and make sure that we're protecting this become, freedom Become a government bureaucrat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to protect the rest of us. Okay, that's interesting. And I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing that the pharmaceutical companies that want to develop a new business model uh, will probably be angling for as much control as they can as soon as they can, will they not? Sure. I, I mean, I would, that would be a good business model for them if, if you know, rent seeking at the, you know, with these, with big companies, that's, you know, there's obviously an economic incentive there if, if the government can hand out favors, make rules. Um, so, I, I, yeah, they, they would be dumb not to get involved. And the way we couch the debate, um, recreational use of marijuana has a bad a, a stigma is attached obviously marijuana causes short-term memory loss for those of us who have imbibed this is obvious <laughs> yeah but um, there are multiple health benefits I mean cannabinoids are a homeostatic kind of kind of substance that allow people that are in discomfort pain or neuropathy or Alzheimer's anxiety or autistic neuroinflammation. There's all kinds of clinical pharmacological uses for cannabinoids that are highly beneficial that could put the pharmaceutical industry out of business. I mean, they're telling us they're coming up with drugs for autism. They're coming up with drugs for Alzheimer's. They're coming up with all these drugs. Well, we have one and it's a plant, and it grows, it's a weed. And we can administer this plant-based substance on our own without the government, without giant regulatory frameworks that will solve a lot of these problems, that pe health problems that people have without paying into the, the death spiral of our current healthcare system. I mean, we're gonna all go broke if we keep giving money to the pharmaceutical firms to come up with new drugs to solve all these problems that we have as we age, as we get sick, as we're exposed to toxins in the environment. So we have to embrace medical cannabis, not recreational, but so medical. Do you think that the uh, pharmaceutical industry will then take over the cannabis industry? Eventually, uh, that's their goal, obviously. I, I, I think also uh, that the tobacco industry actually has been looking at the cannabis industry lately. Sure. Uh, I've noticed a lot of uh, tobacco companies have been dipping around and getting their feet wet as far as uh, recreational pot and everything, especially since Colorado. Uh, I've been looking at stocks in these companies, and, I, and that's how RJR, I Philip Morris. Yeah. Coming up the, with brand they, names, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, well, that's it's their business. You know, it's not not a right. so large leap to go into that. Do you guys think it would be better that the pharmaceutical industry got into it, or the tobacco industry took over it? Well, I think I think personally, I think uh, the more the merrier. The, the the less regulation in terms of you know product quality control, the sort of things that the FDA does, you know, and do do no, uh, you know, uh, make sure that there's no uh, ill effects, that kind of thing. Well, which which but, industry will have less? But but as far as uh, as far as ease of entry, I think I think ease of entry should be the thing that the libertarian should be looking at. Ease of entry for anybody that wants to get into the business. So in other words, uh, as little regulation as possible, because we're actually we're talking about a drug or a, a substance that doesn't have a whole lot of uh, downside. Uh, we know that from from you know millennia of uh, of usage. It's not. It's not addictive. something that's it's it's not addictive. Not it's, yeah, it doesn't uh, cause particular, uh, particularly uh, uh, debilitative effects in any way that, that I'm aware of. And at the end of the day, in, in a free society, you know, this is a decision that an individual gets to make. Yeah, they yeah. get to decide whether they want to use medical cannabis or if they want to use recreational cannabis. When you know they get it on people all across 
you know, uh, Sacramento tonight have come home and have probably, you know, had a glass of wine and to unwind. There's no reason that the government should be getting in between an individual who wants to, you know, unwind with uh, some cannabis. And that's a decision for individuals and not for the government. Well, one way the government is absolutely going to get involved is through taxation. I'm sure that uh, states and counties and probably uh, ultimately the federal government are going to look at uh, cannabis as a, as a huge windfall, sort of like uh, liquor and uh, uh, alcoholic beverages are, are uh, in effect now. Um, the Prop 90 or Prop 64 came up with uh, particular uh, taxation rates: nine dollars and twenty-five cents an ounce for flowers, two seventy-five per ounce for for leaves. Uh, will there be uh, taxes above and beyond that at the uh, local level, or is that just a state tax? Or uh, you know, what's the tax plus a sales tax? I'm assuming. What's the tax uh, situation going to end up looking like? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that question. And first, I have to you know say though that. You know, one of the incentives for, you know, legalizing marijuana across the country, people will try to argue that, well, you're going to get more tax revenue. Well, that's a bad thing because that means more, more money government. from the private sector is, is escaping and going to the government and yeah. being taken away. So that's a bad thing, and I, I never like that rationale. But to answer your question, um, there's going to be a 15 percent excise tax collected by the uh, Bureau of Equalization. That will begin in 2018. That will be on medical and non-medical cannabis. At the retail level? Uh, yes. And on top of that, you will pay the 7.5% sales tax. Okay. And the taxes you mentioned are on the cultivation side for the leaves and the, and, and the plants. And so that will obviously go into the cost of marijuana pushing it up. Okay. And state, cannabis. Yeah, cannabis. <laughs> cannabis, yes. I have to, you know. Get Weed, that. pot, Sorry, ganja. <laughs> And so, but local <laughs> governments will be able to also uh, charge permitting fees uh, and other fees associated with getting that license. So, you know, you're looking at a, a tax rate that, you know, is going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. And I know in Colorado there was some issue uh, there. I believe their medical cannabis uh, was being taxed at 15 percent, and I believe recreational was being taxed at 25 percent. And they were having some black market problems where people. Were, were remain on the black market, and that's inevitable here if, if these tax rates stay this high. Okay. Well, is there going to be a distinction between medical and and uh, recreational in California? No, it'll all be uh, fifteen percent excise okay. plus the sales tax. But I would do want to mention one thing: if you have a card from your local, uh, uh, you know, county public health, you actually between now and two thousand eighteen. You're going to be able to avoid the the seven point seven seven point five percent sales tax if you have the card. Medical marijuana card. Medical marijuana a card. Doctor's prescription. Doctor's, uh, well, not the prescription. It's it's going to be the card that you get from the the public health department of your county. So if you take that card into a, a legal dispensary today, you don't have to pay the uh, seven point five percent sales tax. That was probably an oversight in the law, but I encourage people if you can avoid a tax, take advantage. Okay, then the, the, the obvious question to me is, will the 20, 30, or perhaps higher percent tax rate, when you figure in permitting fees and all the rest, will that raise the price of marijuana to a point where the black market uh, is able to uh, provide a better product for less? I, I would think so, because the black market's been in existence, you know, there's only been a black market before right. uh, this proposition. But with and high prices because of... Uh, the obvious true. reasons. True, Prohibition. true. Prohibition. Prohibition yeah. brings yeah. with high prices. Yeah. But the black market's already there. The infrastructure's already there. So to come in hard with this very high tax to start off, you're not making a lot of incentive for the black market to roll into the new system. If you came in with a very low tax or no tax at all, people would be in the black market would say, well, let's go legal. Let's, there would be an incentive there. But I think it was foolhardy of them to have such a burdensome tax from the get-go um, and not invite sort of the black market to come into the new system. So they should suspend the tax for a period of time, or maybe not have a tax at all, <laughs> but at least suspend it so that there's an incentive for the black market to come into the new system. Uh, do, do you, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that that's not gonna happen, and that we will, we will end up with two markets, a black market and a legal market with uh, lower prices in the black market. Is, uh, that, a, is that a fairly good uh, I, I prediction? Think so. I think so. I mean, it'll be the same with cigarettes, you know, any, any sort what of- you mean um, cigarettes from Indian reservations, that sort of thing? Right, right. I think what we're going to have actually is a two-stage. Uh, we're going to have prohibition for 21 and younger, and we could argue all day about whether it should be 18 or 21. 21's ridiculous, right? You can vote, you can get drafted, you can serve, you know, serve in the military when you're 18. Um, 
So what's going to happen is the law enforcement apparatus that's been put in place as part of drug prohibition is going to be there still, as all bureaucracies are. They exist. They don't go away. And this will be focused on young folks, um, people under the age of 21. So we'll have a bunch of kids that are going to get arrested, prosecuted, um, fined. Their parents will pay because they don't have any money. Their parents will pay for the fact that they toked. But that'll and be a misdemeanor, right? In some cases, it'll be an infraction, a uh, traffic ticket. But not a felony. Uh, even but for, for, a felony. For, yeah. for youth under the age of 21, it's still a so, crime. And uh, I, I do want to say one thing about the, the criminal sanctions, because this is, you know, we're on, you know, to, out to the public. If you've suffered under the drug war, the war on cannabis, and you've received a felony for a, a marijuana related uh, drug uh, charge, you now can come back and have your felony reduced. Or okay, I was going to ask that. Is, it, is this a get out? Of, is this a, a proposition to get out of jail free card? For some, it will be because there are some sitting in in California prisons right now on a felony marijuana related charge, and those people will be able to come back to court and be resentenced under a misdemeanor statute or a misdemeanor but you, but scheme. The, but the prisoner has to take the initiative. Yes, the uh, you'll have to file paperwork. Hire a lawyer. You'll have to hire an attorney. Or, or, you know, do the paperwork yourself. So I encourage people if you, you know, if, if a felony is burdening you, whether it be with your job or your job prospects or getting one of these licenses, felonies will get in the way of that. You know, you need to contact somebody and, and get in there and get that reduced as soon as you can because that's something you can do. And uh, we, you know, you shouldn't have a felony on your record because you cultivated, used or even sold marijuana. And that's and you're in that business too, right? Yes. Legal business. We're a, my the law firm I work for. I work for a gentleman named Roland Teeman. He's a you know, well-known uh, marijuana defense attorney, criminal defense attorney in El Dorado County, Sacramento County, and Placer County. And uh, and we specialize in trying to help people get through this new regulatory process um, to get licensed. We we help with that, and then we also help on the criminal side of things. And it's a shame that you know we even have to exist that. You know, we have to do this for people because of these felonies that are out there and this new regulatory scheme. But we do try to help people. With Got that. a minute left. Just a real quick snapshot. What are the investment implications for getting involved in the marijuana cannabis business? Are they good, bad or watch out for the big guys? Well, at, at this point, I mean, it is still kind of the Wild West. And so if you're a, an entrepreneur and you have some innovative techniques, I say jump in, go to your board of supervisors meeting and get started. That's the show for this week. We're on uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento, Access uh, Cable, uh, and also on uh, www.accesssacramento.org, YouTube, and on cable channels elsewhere around the country. So thank you very much for being part of the show.